If you've been focusing on getting ready for birth, but haven't given much thought to life with a newborn, then you're only halfway there in your preparation. Let me help make the first weeks with your baby so much easier. Go sign up for my Thrive With Your Newborn online postpartum preparation classes at birthfulcourses.com, but you want to do it before baby arrives. So go to birthfulcourses.com today. Welcome to Birthful. I'm Adriana Lozada. I remember my husband, like I'm leaning over the bed, I'm hanging on to him and he kind of just like looks me in my eyes and he's like, let's shut out everybody else. What do you want to do? That is Laurel Gorier, the co-host of the Birth Stories in Color podcast and mom of two, talking about a pivotal moment in her first birth and how her husband held the space and uplifted her autonomy so that she could center her needs after 30 hours of hard Pitocin back labor. His support, along with that of all her extended family and caregivers, allowed Laurel to hold on to her joy throughout the experience. And from the beginning, holding on to that joy had been a key part of Laurel's birth plan. Also, to be honest, at many points, her labor seemed like a big party. You're listening to Birthful, here to inform your intuition. Welcome, Laurel, to the show. I am so very excited to have you here and hear your story. Why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you identify? Yes. Well, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. I love to travel. So I've been lots of places, have lived lots of places. I am a mom of two. I have a five-year-old daughter, three-year-old son. I'm also a wife. I currently live in Columbus, Ohio. I do birth work, a full spectrum, however you land, whatever your support is. I am there to help you, help guide you, help support you. I love birth storytelling in all shapes and forms. Um, So I also host a birth storytelling podcast with a doula sister and friend. And then I recently have started doing birth photography. The way that birth shows up. (laughs) Well, and let's make sure we mention the name of your podcast. Yes, Birth Stories in Color. (laughs) Birth Stories in Color, which I'm going to let everybody know. I'd shared my birth story that I don't often share on Birth Stories in Color. So you can check out that episode as well if you want to (laughs) hear. So take us back. Your daughter is now, you told me before that she's five. Take Mm -hmm. us back to that time when you were just pregnant or figuring out what you wanted for your birth wishes, what were you hoping to have and how did you prepare? Yeah. So in the beginning, when we first found out we were pregnant, both my husband and I really felt like everybody's like comments to us were centered on the pain aspect of birth on the negative parts of birth. And I remember one day, like we were both sitting around and I was like, I don't know, like I'm loving this. <laughs> I'm very excited about this. And I just don't feel like what I'm feeling is matching what everybody is telling me. Like I know those things will show up, but it just, they're not sinking. So from there, we really were intentional about how we talked about the experience, how we absorbed what others were saying. And I just knew from the beginning that I know that I want this birth to be centered in like peace and joy. And I really want to connect with this birth and be very in tune to it. And so that's what I did. Like I set intentions about that. I read everything that I could get my hands on. I was obsessed with watching birth videos on YouTube. (laughs) Just trying to grasp any sort of like positive outlook about the birth experience. So how did it all begin? How did that party start? Yeah. So I was 41 and five days, 41 and five. I had midwives at the hospital. I had contemplated home birth, but we lived in an apartment and I was like, "Mm, I don't know how people do that. That's different. So let's just do a hospital with midwives. So I found a great midwifery practice and around 40 weeks, you know, there was discussions about, okay, what are we going to do to help naturally bring on things? And baby girl was just not about 
coming. I tried all the things. And I do remember getting close to 41 weeks. Um, my midwife was like, well, why don't we try, you know, doing a membrane sweep? And I was like, okay, fine. Did that. And that was the moment where I really was like, yeah, I don't actually know anything about the anatomy of my body. I just remember being like, where are you going during this cervical <laughs> <laughs> where are these membranes you're going to sweep? Yeah, where are these membranes? But we did find out that I was one centimeter, but we did decide from that point on that I should probably be scheduled for an induction, which that wasn't what I wanted. But I also knew that we were moving into a space that it was probably time to like support her coming um, with some help. And I, again, from that point, started to get into a mindset of like, what do I want this induction to look like? So she was scheduled, like I said, I was 41 and five, scheduled induction. My parents came in. We were living in D.C. at the time. So my parents came in that morning. I was scheduled to go in that night. My in-laws had come in the day before. And I remember like my husband had to go to work that morning. So I was at the house by myself took a long shower. And I remember just like sitting on the couch and being like, wow, tonight everything changes. <laughs> and just able to kind of sit in my own reflection about what was going to happen, trying to like prepare myself mentally for what this induction might look like. And then my parents came over and I remember my dad being like, we should have a champagne before we go to the hospital. <laughs> and I'm like, dad, he was ready to party. He was ready to party. I'm like, dad, no. <laughs> so we all drive to the hospital. And I had also informed my best friend that we were going in that night. So she was coming in from New York on the train. And, you know, they had said, oh, your room, like, come at 8 p.m. You'll be ready at 8 p.m. So I get there and they're like, we don't have any rooms. And then I, like, felt myself kind of, like, shut down at that point because I was very prepared for, like, you're going to go in. It's going to be time. It's like everything going in order. So that did take some shifting. And I remember being really upset also because two of the midwives who were on call were two of the midwives who I hadn't met. So I just felt like, oh no, <laughs> things are already starting to derail here. Like this is not okay. But we sat in the hallway while we waited and played cards. And my family did a really good job of like keeping me distracted and really trying to center me back in like, this is just part of how things shift. Like it's okay. Finally get my room. I think like it was an hour, hour and a half. We go in, get me set up. And they started me with Cervidil. And I remember my midwife saying like, we'll see how this goes. Sometimes some people's bodies react very quickly to it. And some people, you know, after the full 12 hours of waiting, nothing. I was one of those people who nothing. So 12 hours go by. My parents were staying at a hotel, so they went back. My my in-laws and my best friend went back to our house because we also had a dog at the time. Like, I was just chilling for the full 12 hours. <laughs> and I want people to hear that because you think, oh, inductions, we'll just get going with this. And actually, if you're jump-starting your body from zero, it can take a long time. It can take days. Exactly. And also the fact that you're having an induction, like there's so much uncertainty attached to it anyways. There's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of mental game with the inductions. Yes. And I do think that kind of happened for all of us. And it was nice to have that time when everybody had left for Frankie and I to, again, get ourselves in a headspace of this might take some time and that's okay. This birth plan has shifted already a couple of ways how are we going to roll with that? So, yeah. So how did you roll with that? 12 hours hit. They did the cervical check. No change. And I felt myself like freak out a little bit because I also knew from there we were going to have to introduce Pedosin, which I knew was going to intensify things. And it was something that I was hoping not to have. My midwife definitely caught on to that because I remember her being like, we don't have to like start it right now eat some pizza because my father-in-law had bought pizza for the nurses, for everybody. So everybody was eating pizza. <laughs> and I will say that my midwives were wonderful. I had an amazing birth team. I'm very, very fortunate and grateful that it worked out in that way. They were just so in tune with my family. Like we had five people in a room. We weren't supposed to have five people, but they were like, whatever. Like, Let's like they just roll with you. You do you. 
um, which was so wonderful. But yes, we started the Pitocin and immediately my body was like, oh, okay, this is what we're doing. I can feel it in the air. It's fall weather. And I'm going to lean into the season this year, which means I'm going to get cozy and comfy, but also look great while doing it when we go apple picking or chill around a campfire. And that's where Faraday comes in because they make the perfect clothes for getting comfy. I just got the softest and coziest jumpsuit. It fits perfectly, feels like I've had it for years, and because it's impeccably finished, I'm going to be going back to it over and over again. They're so confident in the quality of their stuff, they have a lifetime guarantee. They'll replace or fix your clothes forever, no matter what. And to top it all off, Faraday is giving all Birthful listeners 20% off. So stock up on all your fall and winter clothes now. Head to FaradayBrand.com and enter the promo code BIRTHFUL at checkout to snag 20% off all your gear. That's F-A-H-E-R-T-Y Brand.com with promo code BIRTHFUL. Have you ever wondered where all the dirty diapers go when you change your baby? Or if the material in a disposable is safe for baby's skin? Well, we're so excited to tell you about Assembly. Assembly's reusable diapering system is organic, easy to clean, blow-up proof, and can save you up to $2,000 per baby over the cost of disposables. Best of all, they're landfill-free, which is more important now than ever. In the U.S. alone, over 32 billion disposables get thrown in the trash each year. With Assembly, just 44 organic cotton diapers is all you'll need from birth to potty training, compared to 6,500 plus if you're using disposables. Assembly provides you with everything you need, from soft cotton diapers and organic skincare to upcycled storage bags and specially formulated detergent. Learn more at assemblybaby.com and use the code BIRTHFUL15 for 15% off your first order. That's E-S-E-M-B-L-Y baby.com. And I want to say, even though your cervix hadn't dilated, there must have been some change in those 12 hours for them to move from a prostaglandin to soften and ripen and get your cervix ready to Pitocin, which is focused on dilation. So your cervix did change. We just obsess on dilation, but there's so many other things. Yeah. that, And often people have to ask about them because it's not just we all, nurses, everybody focuses just on the dilation. Mm -hmm. And as a birth worker, I'm sure you've had the situation where I ask the provider, yep. can you tell me also about station and exactly. softening and give me more information? Don't right. just give me dilation. Right. Exactly. So things started to get pretty intense. I know that like I, I was trying to move around the room because I was on now on Pitocin, I was having to be monitored. And I just remember I hated the monitors. I know a lot of people say that. And they were just annoying. So there was this back and forth of like getting repositioned on the monitor, having the monitor off, walking to the bathroom, working through contractions. It was just like this cycle. But I will say again, like my birth team was great. I think a lot of times people are very surprised that I had my in-laws and my parents. And I, and I want to say that there was a conversation that was had with all of them about what it would look like. I was very open of, if you're going to be in that space, I need your energy to match mine. If you are unable to help or support or you feel like it's too much, I need you to leave because I cannot have that. I need you to be on the same page as me. I will be naked. So you handle that as you like. I want you to be present, but this is what I'm expecting for your presence. And they all understood that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. But it was intense. And I had a lot of back labor. So I don't even really remember what front contractions feel like. All of my pain and discomfort was in my back. And I tried to describe it to somebody once. And I was like, it felt like after every contraction, like my back, my spine was like breaking and then reforming for like one second and then re-breaking. This is exhausting. And a new nurse came in and they were like, well, why don't you try nitrous oxide? Because my birth plan did not include having an epidural. I wanted to go as long as possible without one. So I was like, sure, yeah, let's, I will do anything at this point. Let's, let's try the nitrous oxide first. I hated the nitrous oxide. Like the first moment of putting it on my face, I was like, this is making me feel like I'm going to throw up. I don't want to do this. Let's not do this. <laughs> mm. But I'm also at this point 
starting to like have those shakes, the transitional shakes. I'm starting to, I'm throwing up a bit more. I'm starting to have that feeling of I'm out of control in this moment. But that was also the moment where I was like, okay, like, this feels excruciating and something has to change. My new nurse had come in and they asked, like, what do you want to do in this moment? And I remember my husband, like, I'm leaning over the bed, I'm hanging on to him, and he kind of just, like, looks me in my eyes and he's like, let's shut out everybody else. What do you want to do? And he's, like, crying. I'm crying. (laughs) But we're just looking. And at that moment, like, I mean, he was very much like, I know what your birth plan said, but like, what do you need in this moment? And I said at that point, like, okay, I think, I think it's time to move forward with an epidural. And at that point, it had been about 30 hours since starting the induction that I had been moving through. I was just tired. Like I was exhausted. And I think everybody knew at that point that I needed something to just let my body settle But they were, of course, waiting for me to come to that um, realization without being pushy, which I appreciated. But I also, I think, needed for him to tap in and be like, it's you. That's it. Nobody else. It's you. So I got the epidural placed and immediately knocked out. Like, I don't even think, I think I was asleep before (laughs) they could even see if it like fully took. I don't even know. But I I do remember before falling asleep, my husband, because he, you know, everybody kind of had been up, but mostly him. He like looks at me and he goes, is it okay if if I go to sleep too? (laughs) Oh, that's so sweet. I think everybody got some rest and I woke up maybe an hour or two after, like refreshed. (laughs) I'm like, hi, everyone. (laughs) We're here. The midwives came in and said, you know, how do you feel about us doing a check, kind of seeing where you are? And I was like, sure, let's do that. And they did a check and they were like, it's time. If you're ready to, if you're feeling, you know, some of those, those urges, that pressure, like, let's, let's go for it. Were you feeling the desire to push? I wouldn't say I wasn't feeling the desire to push, but I definitely like my, I, I would say that they did a like a fair job on my my epidural because at that point I could still feel the pressure, not necessarily any type of pain, but I could feel the pressure during contraction. So I knew when they were coming. So I was like, yeah, let's let's go for it. And I just remember giggling like, wow, okay, we're doing this. And so they got me a mirror because I definitely wanted to be able to see. And so my husband's holding my left leg. My mother-in-law is holding my right leg. My dad's like sitting behind me. My father-in-law is kind of like off to the side. And my mom is holding (laughs) both of my sisters on FaceTime. (laughs) So again, party, like community birth here. Yes. (laughs) And so we start pushing. Something that I don't remember and that I, I have been told, but there was a point where like, I was pushing and they kind of had me stopped. And in that moment, I didn't pick up on any of this, but my daughter did have shoulder dystocia. So the way that it has been told to me is like during that moment, they were actually like pushing down on my stomach. She came out. Um, We did not know if we were having a boy or girl. We love surprises. So we were very much like, let's just see when this baby is born. And so... We had said that I would be the one to kind of like let the room know. So they pulled her up, put her on my chest. And I just remember like crying, like, it's a girl, it's a little girl. So everybody's crying. She's like sitting on my chest. They let her sit there for a second and then took her because of the shoulder dystocia just to make sure that everything was okay. Um, But she was fine. She was beautiful. She was fine. Eight pounds, nine ounces. Um... They made sure she was good and then brought her back over to me and we just hung out. Oh, so good. (laughs) So good. What was the most surprising thing for you out of this experience? That I birthed a whole human. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I think that, I mean, like, in all honesty, that really did blow my mind. Um, But I was able to tap into this other source of myself that I had no idea 
was possible. Like even with how, because it was painful, like I'm very honest with people about that experience, like that birth was painful and that birth did take a lot from me. I still feel the same joy. Like I just feel joyous about it because I know that I I did that. My body did that. And I'm so proud about that. An eight pound, nine ounce whole human I birthed. <laughs> you sure did. So then, and we wanted to focus on your first birth, the birth of your daughter, but you have a son and that is that was a home birth. What made you switch from hospital to home? We moved to a new state and in moving to Columbus, Ohio, I learned about what childbirth was around here. And I was like, I don't feel comfortable being in a hospital. I don't think that I'm going to get the same experience that I had at the other hospital. And that just doesn't feel safe for me. And I also had learned a lot more in between that time about maternal outcomes and especially what that looks like for Black mothers. And I just, I didn't feel like that would be a safe choice. I had also at that point connected with a home birth midwife who I loved. So I knew that I would be able to get the support I needed. And I also knew for my previous birth, that home birth just felt more in sync for me. So we moved to Columbus where my husband teaches is like is an hour outside of Columbus. And I also knew that if I did a home birth there, if at any point there was a need for a transfer, it would be at a hospital that I wasn't comfortable with. So I said, all right, let's see if my parents will be okay with us having a home birth at their home. <laughs> So there was this other layer of informing them that this was an option. For them, it was about safety. They were like, our, you know, our home, they had never, they didn't know home births were a thing. They were like, is this going to be safe? And I'm like, for us, it's safer for us. It makes sense for us. And so they got to be a part of all my midwifery appointments. They got to see that in real action and they got to witness a home birth. Because again, I think I just have community births, like everybody's just there. That's how I roll. And so they got to be a part of that. Uh, but that's so good because it's a lot of responsibility. Let's be honest. Like yes. when you say I'm going to have a home birth, you have to take on a different role in how you approach your birth, which is totally doable. Right. But you just, you know, have to be honest with yourself. And I feel it's fantastic that you had that support in that community and that support from your whole community and your parents. And because people who have a home birth, you hear so often that they're getting so much pushback from their family and they almost have to keep it a secret from their family. Mm -hmm. And it is so joyous to hear the flip side of something completely different of, of community buy-in into exactly, your choices. Exactly. And then for the people, like there were some people who we just didn't share it with because we knew there was going to be that pushback. And I was like, I don't need that. And again, having honest conversations with my parents about this, I was like, you are at any point allowed to say no. So I think them hearing me talk about fear, allowing them to express their fear around it, made it easier for them to be like, okay, this feels like we can do this. Do you feel that the fact that they were part of your journey in the first birth, like they were so such an integral part and you had already had that conversation way back of this is how you show up for me in this space, that work was already done. And then now you just switch where the space, you, you took it to a next level. You're like, okay, yes. now let's do this. Exactly. And so I would send them like, okay, you watch this birth video. Like, this is what it might look like. Um, I started giving them things to read. And then at my appointments, they were then able to talk to my midwife and be able to see and have those conversations. Whereas like, you know, in the hospital, you don't get to do that. They don't get to see that other side. And I think... The reason that I community birth is so important to me is one, because I just, I need my community. I very much thrive off of that. Um, I also know the change that it can have. Like my siblings were also present. And so now as they're talking about expanding their families, they're like, okay, well, how do we like prepare for a home birth? How do we know if that's like an option? Um, so that there is this continued conversation of there's so many different types of births. You just have to do what feels right for you. Thank you, Laurel, so much for sharing your stories and for sharing what an interdependent community 
way of birthing can look like, whether it's in the hospital or at home. That was Laurel Gorier, a wife, mother of two, and a family and reproductive justice advocate. Alongside Daniel Jackson, Laurel co-hosts the Birth Stories in Color podcast, which embraces storytelling as a way to amplify the lived experiences of Black, Indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and multiracial individuals. You can find Laurel on Instagram at Birth Stories in Color. As I reflect on Laurel's story, one thing that stands out is the intentionality with which she set up her big community support. So one thing you can do for you is to create a clear and collaborative support plan with all the members of your birth team. You can start by scheduling a time to have an honest conversation about what you would like and expect from them during your labor and birth and really get specific. Touch upon the ways they can show up for you physically, emotionally, and in advocacy. Can they commit to that plan? And if not, what's your plan B? Also, your healthcare providers are a part of your birth team. So what would this conversation look like with them? How does it feel for you to switch the perspective to one where they are there to support you? and not just make sure everybody is healthy or to tell you what to do. How does that feel? Then the one thing you can do for the rest of us is to commit to finding your joy in community. This really feels like something we all need to be more intentional about as we languish from the sustained stressors of being in a pandemic for over a year and a half. So connect with a friend or family member and plan to do something joyful on a regular basis. So for example, you can join the Girl Trek movement, which unites members of the Black community as they walk for healing, and more information on that can be found at girltrek.org. Whatever it is you end up doing, find something that brings you happiness and creates a sense of connection. And if you'd like to connect more with us at Birthful, we're on Instagram at Birthful Podcast. To learn more about Birthful and my birth and postpartum preparation classes, go to birthful.com. Birthful was created by me, Adriana Lozada, and is a production of LWC Studios. The show's senior producer is Paulina Velasco. Jen Chen is executive editor. Cedric Wilson is our lead producer. Kojin Tashiro is our associate sound designer. And Stephen Colon mixed this episode. Thank you for listening to and sharing Birthful. Be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Good Pods, Amazon Music, Spotify, and everywhere you listen. And come back for more ways to inform your intuition.